Chapter 3 The alleged correspondences between Socrates and Orpheus, or rather between Plato and Orpheus, are explored by Proclus, to whom an esoteric interpretation of Plato's dialogues is tantamount to the initiatory Orphic doctrine. Accordingly, the Orphic Phanes, like the Egyptian Atum Ra, shows forth the soul as an image, icon, of the shining divine intellect. The recognition of the pharaonic Imago Dei, Tutneta in the Egyptian royal theology, and of its restored Osirian wholeness, the right eye of Horus made sound, itself constitutes a sort of initiation that enables the soul's access to the divine realm. Rapper claims that since the times of Syrianos, either Orphism is attached to metaphysics, in order to transform the Neoplatonic doctrine into ritual, or the language of metaphysics is grafted onto a traditional Orphic narrative. However, such theurgic convergency is initially based on Egyptian hermeneutical and cultic patterns. She argues as follows. The rhapsodic theogony ends with a famous hymn to Zeus, in which his identity as the coincidentia oppositorum is revealed. This vision of the world of Zeus gives us a kind of mirror of the Proclin universe, in which each being is a all, and all beings are in each. The multiple states of being, each level mutually reflecting all of the others, proliferate as a hall of mirrors. It is this great world of mutual interpenetration, endlessly expanding as a single drama, that the Orphic Theogony catches. And not surprisingly, this vision is exactly the mythic equivalent of Proclus's central metaphysical views. Proclus's assertion that all Hellenic theology ultimately derives from Orphic mystagogy may be regarded as a normative and paradigmatic claim of his philosophical hermeneutics. Thus Orpheus constitutes the archetypal mark of his metaphysical topography. In this particular sense, the name and image of Orpheus function more like the theological arche, like the canonized philosophical Hypostasis. Hypostasis. Hypostasis? Than as an unquestioned and factual person of ancient history. This imaginative assertion of Proclus, though belonging to the realm of semi mythic genealogies, is shared by the countless followers of the ancient Hellenic tradition and constitutes one of its main etiological kernels. Consequently, it is this image of the esoteric Orpheus that counts, not one provided by the modern academic interpretations that present their hypothetical constructions as an ultimate truth about a given tradition in place of the self-representations, theological images and myths used by adherents of the tradition. For the late Platonic tradition, the fighters, those belonging to the sacred race, Hiera Genea, defend, according to Surianos, the best and most beautiful of philosophies, namely the Cronian way of life. These intellectual defenders of tradition recognize themselves as forming a link in a golden platonic chain, claiming that inwardly all human beings are divine, and therefore must become conscious of this inherent divinity. The anagogic tradition of a journey within consists in an unbroken chain of divinely inspired teachers who both taught and practiced the revealed Platonic mysteries. As Polymnia Athanasiadi remarks, in a society in which political propagandists had raised the principle of imperial legitimacy to a metaphysical level, the Neoplatonists came effortlessly to evolve and spread a dynastic theology. Indeed, by the time of Damascius, the history of the caste had acquired its own mythology as well, for the creation of which all sorts of forged genealogies were mobilized. The, prototypo, the prototypal winged souls of the Neoplatonic golden chain, Crusa Sira, 
were Orpheus, Pythagoras and Plato. But already by the end of the 4th century AD, Porphyry, Iamblichus, Syrianos, Proclus and many others were regarded as divine. Garth Felden had this to say. Likewise, Hierocles described Ammonios as divinely possessed, enthusiasis, with longing for the true goal of philosophy. Reflection on theological and philosophical truths was indeed widely accepted as a prerequisite of divinization. Proclus asserts that immersion in the mysteries of Platonic philosophy could result in divine possession, like a Dionysiac frenzy. And Olympiodorus listed four Platonic dialogues, which in his opinion illustrated these Platonicoi enthusiasmoi. Timaeus, Res Publica, Phaedrus, Theotetus. According to this tradition, Paradosus, Plato himself received the complete science of the gods from Pythagorean and Orphic writings. The science of dialectic advocated by Plato is not found in the Orphico-Pythagorean theology, but both Orphism and Pythagoreanism, whatever these ambivalent terms may mean for different audiences, are viewed as being based on the diff- on the ancient Egyptian and Babylonian revelations. The divine Plato only gave it scientific form, combining the revelatory style of Pythagoreanism with the demonstrative method of Socrates. Hence, in this respect, Socrates' approach is demonstrative, apodeictikon, rather than revelatory. Now, Syrianos, the spiritual guide of both Hermaeus and Proclus, not only proclaimed the harmony, somphonia, between Orpheus, Pythagoras, and Plato, but also depicted Socrates as a kind of saviour, the divine avatar sent down to the world of becoming in order to bring the fallen souls back to the divine banquet. This soteriological function of Socrates is modelled on the analogous function of Orpheus, though the initial meaning of the term soteria is related to the realm of public sponsorship, social benefit and graces provided by local patrons and divinised heroes. In the Hellenistic world, any benefactor, Oyagetes, may be recognised and honoured as a saviour, Soter. However, in a metaphysical sense, the ability to save, the soul's immortalization or alleged homecoming, is the function and privilege of the benevolent gods. For example, the Chaldean Hecate as the life-giving womb, and lightning-receiving womb, or as a formless fire, a Aeneadion poor, visible throughout the cosmos, is indispensable for those seeking salvation. Quote, Soteriologically minded philosophers and theurgists who wish to assure the rising of their own souls later advanced the idea that Hecate, by controlling the crossing of the boundary between humanity and divinity, either could aid the ascent or could force the descent of the soul. End quote. The divine-like souls of true philosophers are not entirely cut off from participation and contemplation of the ideas. In a certain metaphorical sense, they still follow the heavenly retinue depicted in Plato's Phaedrus. They are companions of the gods, opidus theon andras, like the idealized and mythologized Socrates of Syrianos and Proclus. In short, Socrates is understood as an instrument of divine will. His system of pedagogy presumably belongs to the soteriological golden chain of Homer and Orpheus, and his philosophy is no less than a divinely inspired beneficial madness. Both Orpheus and Socrates are presented as spiritual guides, that is, as inspired mystagogues able to reveal the ultimate vision of the ideas, a vision regarded as initiation into the highest mysteries. Before starting this interpretation of the Phaedrus myth, Proclus explains, These things are said by Socrates in the Phaedrus when he is clearly inspired, enthusiazon, and dealing with mystic matters. And the Cytherist Orpheus, like Chiron the centaur, half-brother of Zeus, 
in a certain way embodies the mythical guide of souls most purely. Most purely. As Ilse Trout Hadot says, preparing a direct and material correspondence between music and wisdom. But philosophy is the highest art and highest music, as Plato Socrates himself acknowledges. Consequently, the exemplary poets and singers are entheoi, inspired ones. Although feebly translated as inspired, the Greek word entheos loses its literal force, according to Vlastos. And Socrates is God-possessed, Catechomenos even more. I am a seer, mantis, he says in Phaedrus, since the Greek term mantis may be rendered as diviner or prophet. In a sense, it is God himself, ho theos autos, who speaks to us through them, since the possessed speakers know nothing of the things they speak. The Greek entheos literally means within is a God or in God. This indwelling Theos, not unlike the Egyptian Ba in its simulated sacred receptacle, speaks from the person, or from the animated cultic statue in a strange voice, sometimes resembling the so-called language of the birds, or the primordial noise of the creative sound. The most common Greek terms for this, or similar states, are mania, Madness, frenzy, inspiration, and ekstasis, to stand or be outside oneself. Every seer, filled by the ritually ignited and conventionally performed frenzy, stands in a special relationship to the deity, because the words he utters presuppose either the telestic madness of Dionysus, or the prophetic madness of Apollo. But what about knowledge, which is not human in its origin? Or well, strictly speaking, this knowledge presupposes that the speaker himself knows nothing. According to Vlastos, in Socrates' view, the effect of the god's entry into the poet is to drive out the poet's mind. When the god is in him, the poet is out of his mind, ekphron, or intelligence is no longer present in him. So he may find himself saying many things which are admirable, pola kaikala, and true without knowing what he is saying. It is because he is like the diviner that the inspired poet is out of his mind. For Socrates, diviners, seers, oracle givers and poets are all in the same boat. All of them in this view are know-nothings, or rather worse, unaware of their sorry epistemic state. They set themselves up as repositories of wisdom emanating from the divine, all-wise source. What they say may be true, but even when it is true, they are in no position to discern that there is in it what is true. They are in no position to discern what there is in it that is true. They convey truth to the extent that they repeat the divine voice which may serve as a truth speaking Cathagamon, the one who leads and who shows the way, and may deceive an Agamemnon alleged and may deceive, as Agamemnon allegedly was deceived by Zeus, although Proclus is eager to explain this deception, Casa ten aporichton, theorian, eager to, uh, that is, according to the esoteric, or secret, unspoken, mysterious mode of seeing. This is so because the revealed myths and hieratic customs may be educational, pi doitakui, Pai doi tekoi, or appropriate for the young, and more divinely inspired, entheastikotoroi, that is more philosophical, philosophotoroi, and appropriate for the initiates. As Robert Lamberton points out, when Proclus discusses the differences between Homer and Plato, he presents Homer as inspired and ecstatic an author who offers a direct revelation and is in contact with absolute truth. Plato is seen as coming later to the same information and treating it differently, establishing it solidly, solidly by the irrefutable methods of systematic thought. The Greek word for God, theos, is itself related to the act of the seer. 
The divine revelation may be received in the form of myth, muthos. Such a myth is to be used properly because the surface is only a veil or screen, parapetasma, behind which another metaphysical truth lies awaiting its inspired hermenios. Even Homer's blindness is regarded as a divinely established symbol that points to the dark and transcendental character of Homer's vision. In this respect, Proclus argues that Socrates, the literary personage of Plato's Republic, in fact is deceiving, is deceived regarding the way in which myths represent the truth. So what does it mean to be a seer, both the teller of myths and the inspired interpreter of the revealed myth? As Walter Burkett explains the Greek terms, as interpreted sign is Thesphaton, the seer is Theoprotos, and what he does is a Thyadzein, or Entheadzein, insofar as the seer speaks in an abnormal state. He requires in turn someone who formulates his utterances, the prophetes. The word for seer itself, mantis, is connected with the Indo-European root for mental power, and is also related to mania madness. Be that as it may, the Platonic philosophy is viewed by Proclus as divine philosophy because it shone forth, it clamsi, for the first time, through the good grace of the gods. Therefore, its amazing noetic tradition repeats the dazzling appearance of Farnes, the Orphic atom, whose primeval shining forth from the ineffable darkness constitutes the noetic pleroma, the mound of Heliopolis. Accordingly, the ineffable night is the egg from which the solar birds sprang forth on the first morning, in illo tempore.